God Network News. Where we give you a new perspective. On events happening in our world today. This is GNN. This is God Network News, Episode 8. Greetings, GNN fans, to another episode of God Network News. Today we're going to continue with our series by Fred Markert, and this time we're going to be looking into what God is doing in India and China. Two very exciting places in the world where God is moving powerfully by His Spirit. So let's get right into it. Let me tell you about India. Oh, I love India. I love going to India. If you've never been to India, you have missed one of the most unique things in the world because there's nothing on earth like India, nothing else like it. You have to go to India once before you die. Okay, over a billion people, mostly Hindus, in India. But God has been moving with great power, you know. 1990, 33 million believers. By 96, 46 million. By 99, there are 57 million. The church is growing in India. And see the graph? The never-ending increase of the kingdom of God. It's going up. It's a, good, it's a good deal in India. In fact, in India, you guys, every day, 10 to 15. 15,000 new believers are publicly baptized every single day. And it's illegal to get baptized in India. And many of them go to jail. Many of them are kicked out of their families. But it's amazing what God's doing. In fact, I want to tell you a story, okay? Uh, we had a DTS about five or six years ago uh, at our base. And uh, it was a bunch of, you know, 18, 19, 20-year-olds. Most Westerners, Europe, Europe, America, United States, some Mexicans and others. And uh, it was one of the hardest DTSs we ever had. Uh, it was just so hard to disciple these people. Every school has a different personality. Like you guys, you are really awesome. You are an awesome school. Isn't this true? Vinny, you're, you are an awesome school. You know, not every crossroad. Every crossroad is a little different. You guys rock, man. I would want to, if, if I had my choice, I would recruit every one of you to come work with me <laughs> because that's, and I don't, I don't invite people easily because I just want the best. I'm serious. But I would take every one of you because you guys rock. See, you are a unique school. And I know Sean and Kit would take you and Vinny would take you and Bob and Carolyn want you. And you know, you know the Campus Crusade Four Spiritual Laws, you know, God loves you, has a wonderful plan for your life. You know that track? Well, we have our own version in YWAM. YWAM loves you, and you have a wonderful life for our plan. <laughs> so I have that, <laughs> okay? Anyway, we had this, this team of these kids, and you guys, no matter what we did, we could not disciple the guys. The guys were bad. The guys refused to wash their clothes. And they piled up their dirty clothes in a big pile in the guy's dorm, and they refused to wash their clothes. You know why? When they lived at home, mommy washed their clothes. But mommy did not come to Colorado Springs with them. <laughs> and so you know what they would do? Every Saturday, the guys would make a Walmart run to buy underwear. <laughs> they bought new underwear every week instead of washing their underwear. Now, why am I telling you this? <laughs> Because I want to encourage you about teenagers you may have, <laughs> number one. And I want to show you that God uses even subnormal people. <laughs> Not only normal people, <laughs> but subnormal people, <laughs> okay? So that was the school. It was like this. No matter what we did, couldn't disciple the guys to wash their clothes. It was time for outreach. We popped them on a plane, flew them into Bombay um, uh, to, let's see... Yes, no, not that. We flew them into, let's see if I can get a little, no, it's not. We flew them into Bombay, and then we were going to take them out here to Maharashtra, uh, because remember I told you there are 600,000 villages that have never heard the gospel? And so a lot, there's a lot of them in Maharashtra in central India. So we wanted to take them to a village to preach where they've never heard. 
Well, when we got to Bombay, they had been on planes 40 hours, they were jet lagging, they were tired. When they saw India, they went into culture shock, you know, it was like instant culture shock because it was so different. And one of our Indian YWAM leaders named Natin, uh, he met them there at the airport and we decided to put them in a hotel overnight and then bring them to Maharashtra the, the next day so they can get a good night's sleep. So Natin puts them in five different taxis and gives the taxi drivers instructions to the hotel. Well, four taxis went right to the hotel. The fifth taxi driver forgot the way to the hotel. He forgot where he was supposed to go. And so we had three YWAM girls in the back seat and a YWAM guy in the front seat, none of whom could speak Hindi. And we had a taxi driver who forgot the direction, who spoke no English, only Hindi. Lost in the middle of Bombay at three o'clock in the morning, you know, and it was not a good thing. And so the girls in the back seat, they said, they taught us in DTS that God always has a plan. We need to ask God, what are you trying to teach us? <laughs> and God, what should we do? And so the girls prayed and they said, we've got the plan from God, see? And the guy in the front seat, his name was Ed. He was a chemical engineer. So he's a very logical thinker, you know? <laughs> and so the girls said, God told us the plan. We'll pray in the back seat. God will give us directions. Then we will lay hands on you, Ed, and then you will turn to the taxi driver and speak in tongues. <laughs> and Ed said, this is not a good plan. This is the wrong plan. We need a different plan. <laughs> and they said, nope, this is from God. <laughs> and so the three girls prayed in the back seat. And the first girl who heard the voice of the Lord, her name was Sherry Shepherd. God spoke to her and said, go three blocks, there will be a train station, turn right. They laid hands on Ed in the front seat, prayed for him. He turned to the taxi driver. He spoke in tongues. The taxi driver smiled, nodded his head yes, went three blocks to the train station, turned right. Okay? They prayed again in the back seat. And the second girl to hear from the Lord's name was Danelle. And Danelle heard, go two more blocks, turn left. Laid hands on Ed, speaks in tongues. In five minutes, they got to the hotel. In five minutes. God led them right to the door of the hotel. That would sure encourage your faith, first day of your outreach, wouldn't it? So next day, we, bring, we put them on a train, bring them out to Maharashtra, and we brought them to a village that had never heard the name of Jesus. And what we did is, uh, this village also had no rain for a whole year, and if they didn't get rain soon, they would have no rice harvest, they would starve. So they were having a drought. And when they got to the edge of the village, the villagers had never seen foreigners and every villager came running out of their homes and they came running to meet the YWAMers. And one of the 19-year-old boys got really excited. And so he started to preach. And he said, we have heard that you have no rain. And the reason you have no rain is because you worship idols. And the DTS leader was like, oh, good preaching, that's scriptural, keep preaching, you know. And then he said, if you will repent from your idolatry, God will bless you and bring, you know, he will bless you. And the DTS leader was like, woohoo, good preaching, keep going. And then he got a little bit too excited. <laughs> and he said, and I want to prove to you that we serve the one true God and you serve idols. He said, tomorrow we will come back to your village. And the very second we put our foot in your village, the rain will come for the first time in a year to prove to you that we serve the one true living God. You know? And the DTS leader said, Jesus, 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 Jesus. <laughs> That's what he said. <laughs> I asked him later, his name was Jimbo. I said, Jimbo, what were you thinking? He said, Fred, honest to gosh, I was thinking, dude, you won't even wash your underwear and you're prophesying rain in the nations, you know? <laughs> See? <laughs> you know? So, they prayed really hard the next 24 hours, came back to the village the next day, and the second they put their feet in the village, <laughs> the rain came for the first time in a year. The entire village ran out to meet the YWAMers. They preached the gospel. 
40 Hindus knelt down in the mud and got radically saved that day. Here's a picture of just the men who got saved that day by kneeling in the mud. We took them right down to the river to baptize them. You know why we baptized them immediately? Because we wanted to teach them something, you guys. Listen. In the Western world, our highest value is understanding. We want to understand things. And we say, let me understand your principle, God, and then I'll decide whether to obey it or not. See? We want to understand before we obey. But that is not God's value system at all. In the Great Commission, it says, go into all the world teaching them to understand. <laughs> no. Teaching them to obey all I've commanded you. Why does God command obedience? Remember what we talked about the first day? He's Lord and we're not. <laughs> That's the message that needs to come across. God is God and we are not. And we need to turn from our selfishness and obey the living God, okay? And so what happens, we said, okay, here's the deal. We're going to take you and we're going to baptize you. Don't worry about what it means. We'll explain it later. But God commands baptism and he is Lord. We're going to dunk you in the water. Then we'll explain it later. Well, we're there dunking everyone in the water, baptizing them. And uh, here's, a, uh, here's Natin, and Jim, here's Natin, here's Jimbo. We're baptizing them all in the river. <laughs> and uh, as we're baptizing them, the police came and arrested everyone because <laughs> it's illegal. And Jimbo, he's Canadian, he's a good guy. He married Danelle, the girl in the back seat from that story. He was her DTS leader, and he was really good. He waited till she was out of DTS before he got romantically involved. But then he married her. He said, what a woman, man. I want this woman who can hear the voice of God. You know? <laughs> and so uh, they're baptized. They get arrested. The police arrest everyone. And Jimbo's like, woohoo, this is so cool. He said, I get arrested for preaching the gospel in the Hindu world. He said, last outreach, I got arrested for preaching the gospel in the Muslim world. He said, next outreach, the Buddhist world. He said, I want to get arrested in every major religion for preaching Jesus. See? That's his goal. And he's, he's been our uh, leader, our team leader, in one of the darkest, hardest parts of Tibet with his wife and two kids now. They're in the heart of, they've been in the heart of Tibet. Anyway, in fact, you know, on their outreach before this, in the Muslim world, they were showing the Jesus film in this Muslim country, and uh, the secret police in this country figured out that our team was missionaries. And so every time we get off the bus in a village, the secret police were waiting at the bus station and they would instantly arrest everyone and put them under house arrest in a hotel and lock them in. Well, Jimbo, I just love the spirit. It's the spirit of David. Who are these uncircumcised Philistines to raise their fist against the armies of the living God, you know? So at night, they would take all the sheets off the bed, tie them together, throw it out the window, climb down the windows, go throughout the village showing the Jesus film. And then in the morning, they'd climb up the sheets, go back into the hotel, and the secret police would unlock the doors and say, did you have a good night? And they go, oh yes, we had a great night, <laughs> see? And then they'd put them on the bus and they'd go to the next village where they did it all over again, see? This is what God, this is what God wants us to do. Now, well, not everyone in here, okay? We'll talk about that in a few minutes. But this is what God wants the church to do, see? We need to have the spirit of David, aggressive, let's go for it, in love, tenderness, compassion. Anyway, they get arrested. They're going to, and by the way, we get everyone out. We've never lost anyone yet, so we always get them unarrested, eventually. Yeah, eventually, that's a good word, eventually. Okay? So Natin just told me the story. He told me the story uh, right after it happened. He was with me in Colorado Springs. He said, Fred, we were driving to the police station, and there was a white-haired man who'd got converted he was about 80 years old he said the police started to yell at him and they said you are a disgrace to your family you are a shame to our country look at you you are at the end of your life why are you turning from the gods of our fathers and following these foreign gods and Natin said this man looked at the policeman and said all my life I have prayed to our Hindu gods and they have never once answered my prayer. He said, yesterday, one time I prayed to Jesus and asked for rain, and the rains came, 
And he said, I will serve him all the rest of the days of my life. See, that's what God's doing. Natin just told me, he just visited me again three weeks ago, or about three months ago, I mean, in Colorado Springs. He said, Fred, guess what's happened as a result of this? He said, we've been working hard for a number of years since this. He said, the word of this great miracle has gone out throughout all the villages in that region of India. They heard about it because the villagers, even the ones who didn't get saved, were telling the story. And he said, Fred, we've been able to plant 350 churches of converted Hindus in a hundred mile radius around this because of the great news of the power of God, see? In just three years, that's what it took, you guys. That's the kind of thing God wants to do. And God did that through a 19-year-old who wouldn't wash his underwear. <laughs> so just think what he could do through you. <laughs> it would be awesome what he could do. Yeah. In Daniel 2.35, the scripture says, The rock, and that talks, that's a symbol of Jesus. The rock that struck the statue, and the statue was made of like gold and silver and all the clay, it, it represented the ungodly kingdoms in the world. And it says the rock struck the statue. See, God, it's Zephaniah. I mean, it's, uh, yeah, Zephaniah 2.11. God wants to destroy all the gods of the land. See, it's the same message in the Bible. The rock struck the statue and it became a huge mountain and filled the whole earth. It's another picture of God saying, church, I want my kingdom to fill the whole earth. It starts small. It's a little rock. A little rock. But little rocks become huge mountains. Never despise the days of small beginnings. Never feel bad about the little rocks that you have in prayer or in ministry or on your outreach. Little rocks in the kingdom become huge mountains and fill the whole earth because of who our God is. See, that's what it says. Let me tell you how this is happening in China, this scripture. Uh... Uh, in China, largest country on earth right now, but in two years, it'll be probably the second largest. India will be the largest because of population growth rate. But God is moving in China. It is so cool. 1950, only a million believers. By 1980, 40 million. By 90, it was up to 60 million. By 92, 75 million. And the current most accurate estimates, and it's hard to know for sure because China is the way it is, but the current most accurate estimates we have are a hundred million radical believers in China. It is incredible what God's doing in China. It's a cool thing. Uh, in fact, 10 to 20,000 Chinese convert every single day, you guys. This is the largest and greatest movement to Christ anywhere in the world at any time in all of history. And you are alive during this season. Is that an accident? Is that a coincidence? No. God has allowed you to live in this season of great spiritual harvest because he wants to use your lives to impact the world and be part of this, okay? It's awesome what's happening. I'll tell you some stories, okay, uh, of some things happening in there. Zhengzhou. I ran a school of strategic missions here two or uh, three years ago or so. We started the School of Strategic Missions where we trained people to go long-term as missionaries out to these part of the world. We ran it here, and I love, and I took all my the young disciples in the school. We went to China because uh, I wanted them to be in the heart of the move of God and experience the power of the Holy Spirit where he's moving the most. And most of the conversions in China, well, I should say the greatest amount, are in uh, this province, the Hernan province of China greatest moves of the Holy Spirit anywhere on the planet, but also the greatest persecution and martyrdom as a result of the great moves of God. So we went to a city just north of Zhengzhou here, and we went to a university to work there for three months at a university teaching English and, and work with uh, convert Chinese people to the Lord Jesus plant underground churches. And you guys, the first day I was in the city, I, I was just praying. I remember waking up and I, in my quiet time. I said, God, this is the province with the greatest moves of the Holy Spirit. I would just love to see something. I would just love to see the touch of God in this place. And so I walked down to the main street of town and I was walking down the street. I said, God, I would just like to see, you know, just a touch of the Holy Spirit. And you guys, I was not on the main street of town more than five minutes. And a, an old 
Chinese lady, she must have been about 70, she walks up to me really slowly and in broken English, she says, the God lives in me. And she said, does the God live in you? She was witnessing to me. She was witnessing to me. She saw a foreigner. She said, he's going to get the gospel as best as I can, even though I don't speak his language very well. And she was, and I looked at her. I said, yes, the God lives in me too. She began to cry. She hugged me. I'm hugging her. And I was just amazed because she could have been martyred for what she just did. They martyr people in her non-province for sharing their faith, especially publicly. She could have been martyred, but it didn't matter to her. She said, there's a foreigner, he's getting the gospel. And you guys, my heart broke for the church around the world because I realized this woman is willing to share her faith even if it means she dies. And we who live in the free parts of the world are so, it's so rare that we ever share our faith. How can we live a life of lesser commitment than these people who are heroes of the faith? How can we live a lesser life? You know, we do. I mean, it's the state of the church. Why? Because the church doesn't understand what God wants to do. We don't have a lot of, and I'll tell you why that happens. Uh, we'll talk about why the church is in the condition we're in around the world, okay? So anyway, we're at this university. Here's the university. There were 3,000 students. We're teaching English. And you guys, the first week we were there, uh, we met this gal. Here's one of my young disciples. His name is Adam. Good guy from Portland, Oregon. Okay, this was our very first convert. She was a Buddhist communist, uh, you know, in university. And Adam led her to the Lord, you know. And she said, oh, it's so great. I'm a Christian now. This is so wonderful. The Lord really touched her. She said, what do I do now that I'm a Christian? And Adam said, uh, read the book of John. Because see, uh, that's what you tell young believers. She came back in two hours. She said, I've read the book of John. Now what do I do? Adam goes, uh, read the New Testament. She came back to class the next day. She said, I've read the New Testament. Now what do I do? You guys, you can't believe the zeal in the church, the underground church in China. She, he said, ah, uh, uh, read the Old Testament. <laughs> She came back in two days. She read the Old Testament. <laughs> and she said, what do I do now? Adam said, share your faith. She comes to class the next day. She had won three of her university student classmates to the Lord. <laughs> you know? And she said, you know what is? I've been reading the Bible. I see this thing about baptism. She said, I want to get baptized. And Adam said, great, we'll baptize you. She said, but take me to the fountain on the main street of town in the center of the city. I want to get baptized in the fountain and declare to all of China that I am now a follower of Jesus Christ. And Adam said, if we baptize you in the fountain, they will kill you. You will be martyred. They martyred. She said, I know, but I don't care. I want China to know that I'm a follower of Jesus. You guys, it took us three weeks to convince her not to get baptized in the fountain where she finally let us baptize her in her dorm room in the bathtub. Because we were trying to teach her, we were trying to teach her the rules, okay? Here's the rules of frontier missions. If you're going to go plant the church where it isn't, rule number one, there are only two rules, okay? Rule number one, don't get killed. <laughs> because if you get killed, you can't plant the church, okay? So don't get killed. So we were trying to teach her rule one, don't get killed, you know? Then rule two is, ignore rule one. Okay. Anyway, she got that. It's awesome what's happening all over China, you guys. It's absolutely amazing. And in fact, you guys know that Chinese church has announced they have a goal of releasing 100,000 new missionaries to the Muslim world. See, through the Back to Jerusalem movement, it is awesome what's happening. In fact, from our ministry and our base in Colorado Springs, we're helping to provide some training materials to train these underground Chinese believers is absolutely cool. We better take a break. We'll take a break. All right, that was some exciting news about what God is doing in the world, not what the devil is doing in the world, but what Jesus is doing in the world. And it is amazing. Uh, we're going to see the countries of India and China 
used mightily by God, I believe, to bring His glory throughout all the nations of the earth. Right now, it might look like they're communist or Hindu or Muslim, but God's going to turn that around and He's going to use them for His glory to do a final push of missions to spread God's glory all over the world as the waters cover the seas. You watch, God's going to do it. Just listen to this great song. <laughs> 